Section One of Louis Pasteur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami, M.D. Louis Pasteur by Albert Keim and Louis Lumet. Translated by Frederick Tabor Cooper. Epigram from the lives of men who have marked their passage with a trail of enduring light let us piously gather for the benefit of posterity every detail down to the slightest words the slightest acts calculated to reveal the guiding principles of their great souls pasteur chapter one a studious boyhood louis pasteur is one of the glories of france and among them all the one whose light shines clearest and most fertile in results. His name is radiated throughout the world, and for scientists and laymen alike, it symbolizes that spirit of humanity which strove to succor all the ills of his fellow men, and that genius for invention which opened vast new horizons to the researches of science. His sovereignty is now undisputed. There is no nation which has not rendered him due homage, and as his fame has widened, it has, according to his own desire, increased the moral patrimony and the intellectual force of his native land. Louis Pasteur was descended from one of those ancient peasant families that were attached for centuries to the land they tilled, and who have given so many illustrious sons to France. In the seventeenth century his ancestors were still serfs of the soil in Franche-Comté, and the first who rose from servitude was Louis Pasteur's great-grandfather, Claude Etienne, who, having abandoned the labor of the fields, was in the middle of the eighteenth century a tanner at Salon, and one of the bourgeoisie of that town. He came of a race distinguished for serious-mindedness and aptitude for toil, positive qualities which produced artisans solicitous of the good renown of their calling, and gifts of imagination which urged them on to raise themselves above their environment by a superior education. Louis Pasteur's father, Jean-Joseph, an orphan from early childhood, was born to Jean-Henri, the third son of Claude Etienne, on the 16th of March, 1791, in the midst of the Revolution. He was reared by his grandmother, but was taken from her by the conscription of 1811, and having been assigned to the 3rd Regiment of the line, he served throughout the war in Spain in the army of the Emperor. He made a good soldier, well-disciplined and intelligent, and he won his first promotions slowly, through good conduct and calm courage. Corporal in 1812, quartermaster in 1813, sergeant major and chevalier of the legion of honor in 1814 returning from spain he was one of those who took part in that immortal campaign of france in which napoleon expended all the marvellous resources of his military genius to save the country from invasion yet was powerless in the face of adverse fortune after the emperor's abdication jean joseph pasteur was placed on the retired list by the new government he returned to Salon to resume his trade of tanner, and shortly afterwards he married Jeanne Etiennette Roqui of an ancient family of humble station. The bare problem of living was a difficult one, for the bride had brought nothing to their union except her cheerfulness, her gentle disposition, and her two industrious arms. Accordingly, it was not long before Joseph Pasteur decided to try his luck by removing to Dole and there he established himself in a modest little house in the rue des tanneurs it was there that louis pasteur was born on the twenty seventh of december eighteen twenty two the family continued in straitened circumstances in spite of long and weary toil he removed a second time to marneau and at last made his permanent home at arbois the tannery was situated near a stream the Cuissance, in the low-lying town, surrounded by picturesque slopes of countryside, and it was here 
in an austere dwelling, in the presence of living examples of energy and courage, and under the influence of a nature that was alternately gay and melancholy, that Louis Pasteur received his first impressions. The little town of Arbois bears a coat of arms that might have applied to the man who was not only a great scientist, but also a benefactor of humanity. On a field azure, a pelican, or, plucking her breast above her young, supported on a nest or, with drops of blood gul. Its population, consisting of a few bourgeois families, and chiefly of vine-growers and artisans, are rough in manner and at the same time proud. They convey an impression of stalwart courage and rugged honesty. Joseph Pasteur numbered among them several chosen friends. Dr. Dumont, retired army surgeon, M. Boisson de Meret, the historian of Franche-Comté, M. Romanet, the principal of the high school, and a few others besides who were frequent visitors at the tannery. Young Louis used to listen to their conversations in which duty, industry, and patriotism were exalted, and through the direct influence of his father he became imbued with high and noble sentiments. While still very young he was sent to the primary school, and later to the Arbois College, where he began his classical studies. As a pupil he was rather slow and gave no indication of brilliant qualities. He studied diligently but without enthusiasm, and at times he would fall into long reveries, which seemed to isolate him from the outside world. When he was not attending his classes and during vacations, he was fond of playing and of roaming across country, but he avoided all brutal games such as destroying nests and killing birds, for he suffered at the sight of any kind of suffering, whether of man or beast. From his father, who was a reflective, opinionated, yet kind-hearted man, Louis Pasteur inherited a strong will, not yet sure of itself, but which was destined later on to become the dominant force of his life. A prudent judgment, a practical common sense based upon experience which protected him from hasty conclusions, and on the other hand, he derived from his mother the secret side, so to speak, of his nature, a quivering sensitiveness, a vivid imagination, an intuitive intelligence, which often revealed to him the hidden mystery of things, through swift, vast flashes of illumination, also kindliness, love of the arts, and a taste for poetry. It was undoubtedly in obedience to these tendencies inherited from his mother, and which belonged rather to the emotional than to the intellectual side of his nature, that among all the subjects taught in the Arbois College, he showed no preference for anything but drawing up to the age of thirteen years. Within the family circle he was regarded as an artist, and he enjoyed quite a little local fame. He used to draw crayon portraits, and that of his mother, done with a free hand in pastel, revealed a character dependent upon sincerity and truth but the alluring yet sometimes hazardous fame of artists was not what joseph pasteur desired for his son according to his grave conception of life his highest ambition was to see him in the assured position of a professor for the simple man had a great respect for the ability to teach and there was no one whom he placed higher than those who preside over the unfolding and nurturing of young minds when barely sixteen years of age, Louis Pasteur, who at this time was applying himself with tireless tenacity to the pursuit of his studies, was sent to Paris for the purpose of being prepared to enter the École Normale. This meant a sacrifice on the part of the family which had been augmented to the extent of two young daughters. But it was lightened by the concessions made by the director of the pension, Monsieur d'Arbet, a compatriot from Franche-Comté. Louis Pasteur left his beloved little town of Arbois, accompanied by one of his fellow pupils, Jules Versel, in October 1838. But no sooner had he reached Paris than a sombre melancholy seized him. 
he could not forget the home circle he had left behind him and in consequence of these memories that kept him awake throughout long nights he fell into a state of languor and ill health that rendered him unfit for any work oh if i could only smell the odour of the tannery he used to murmur to his compatriot jules Versel, i should be well again pasteur always retained his profound love for arbois and even in the days of his greatest fame he used to return there every year to pass his vacation the director of the pension m d'arbet fearing that the severe attack of homesickness from which his young pupil was suffering might have a disastrous effect upon his health wrote to the father and the latter regardless of his business hurried to his son and promptly brought him back to the tannery after his return home louis pasteur seems for a while to have been in an unsettled state happy to be back again with his family and yet perhaps secretly ashamed of having failed in his duty by not staying in paris in this condition it was his emotional side which prevailed for the time being and while he continued to follow the courses in the college at arbois he returned to his drawing and his pastels with passionate interest he made numerous portraits of his friends and neighbours and there are some that have qualities which reveal a true artistic talent the mayor of arbois m parot the recorder of mortgages m blondeau some young girls some old men and one nun meanwhile having regained his courage as though he had once for all triumphed over the weakness which had caused him to hesitate in his path louis pasteur finished his course in rhetoric triumphantly but since the college at arbois had no classes in philosophy the problem was once more raised as to where he should continue his studies the paris experiment had been disastrous accordingly joseph pasteur decided to send his son to besancon which was quite near and which he himself visited occasionally for business reasons it is from this period that we may date louis pasteur's incredible capacity for work which enabled him to endure unlimited fatigue and also gave his grave deep-seated invincible strength of will which refused ever to recognize obstacles a manly letter written to his father and cited by m valery radeau his son-in-law in the fine work which the latter consecrated to him la vie de pasteur reveals to us the frame of mind in which he pursued his course in philosophy he had disowned his talent for drawing and scorned the reputation of portrait painter which had followed him to besancon for he wrote none of this leads to the ecole normale i would rather stand at the head of my classes than receive ten thousand praises flung out superficially in the course of current conversation we shall see each other on sunday my dear papa for monday if i am not mistaken will be the day of the fair if we go to see m donat his professor of philosophy we can talk to him about the ecole normale my dear sisters i recommend to you once again to be industrious and to love each other when once we have acquired the habit of work we can no longer live without it besides work is the thing upon which everything else in this world depends by means of knowledge we raise ourselves above everybody else but i hope that you do not need this advice and i am sure that every day you sacrifice many a moment to studying your grammar love each other as i love you while awaiting the happy day when i shall be admitted to the ecole normale january twenty sixth eighteen forty there we have the whole ambition of this young philosopher he admired and respected his teachers and he dreamed of nothing else than to become a professor in his turn and fulfil toward others that fine and noble duty of enlightening and training other minds his application to his studies was rewarded on august twenty ninth eighteen forty he successfully passed at besancon his examinations for the degree of bachelor of letters this was his first degree but he was destined to follow it up by obtaining in later years every degree that the university has within its gift 
for this incarnate spirit of innovation this revolutionary genius so to speak had a deep respect for degrees and functions and titles which gave an assured position in society his examination was not especially brilliant but he received good marks in greek latin philosophy and french composition low marks in history and geography and excellent ones in the sciences his dominant qualities were already revealing themselves in this first examination furthermore having passed his baccalaureate louis pasteur whom the director of the school had taken on as assistant tutor for the tannery was far from prospering continued to pursue special courses in mathematics this precise trend given to his studies which delivered him over into the hands of science in no way prevented him from appreciating literature and poetry this was the reverse side of his nature the sentimental and dreamy side which had need of nourishment and which never was wholly effaced by any amount of abstract studies studies of a kind that we should have expected to find most distasteful to him louis pasteur loved beyond all other books the essay on the art of being happy by joseph droz he appreciated the honesty of its sentiments the gentleness of its philosophy and the kindliness which emanated from one and all of its aphorisms he also read my prisons by silvio pellico some rather dull novels which he recommended to his sisters and some poetry he had a friend who shared his literary enthusiasms charles chapuis with whom he was destined throughout life to enjoy a more than brotherly intimacy and they used to work themselves to the highest pitch of exaltation by reading together the meditation of lamartine poetry rested pasteur after the strain of mathematics and far removed from figures and calculations it afforded him emotions so delicate that sometimes he was moved to tears nevertheless louis pasteur was by no means neglecting his scientific studies and his preparation for the ecole normale he even thought for a time of applying for admission to the polytechnique but he renounced this idea in order not to scatter his efforts too widely on august thirteenth eighteen forty two he was passed at dijon as bachelor of mathematical sciences with low notes in chemistry and on the twenty sixth of the same month in the competitive examination for the ecole normale he obtained fifteenth place out of twenty two candidates who were declared eligible to take the second tests far from satisfied with this last result he decided not to continue in the competition but to devote another year to preparation in order to make a brilliant entry into this great school which was the object of his highest ambitions to this end he left besancon and strong of purpose precociously mature confident that this time he would be able to conquer the regret which he was bound to feel at being separated from his family that he loved so tenderly he once more set his face toward paris at the end of his vacation in eighteen forty two with the firm determination to fulfil his duty toward himself and toward science end of section one section two of louis pasteur by albert keim and louis lumet translated by frederick tabor cooper this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter Two: A Laborious and Enthusiastic Youth, Part One. He was at this time a young man with a grave and meditative face, but under an apparent coldness he hid an ardent and enthusiastic heart and an imagination ever on the alert. Louis Pasteur feared nothing from the dangers of Paris his powerful strength of will protected him from pleasures which might otherwise have turned him from his path and he was glad to realize how easily his passionate love of work enabled him to dispense with them on arriving at the pension barbet located in the impasse des feuillantines he once more found chapuis 
the confidential friend and faithful companion of his leisure hours and he mapped out his daily life in such a way as to extract a maximum of profit from the employment of his time he roomed with a few comrades not far from the pension and his entire time was devoted to study too much of his time to suit chapuis who would have liked a greater proportion of amusement and too much also to suit his father who was anxious about his health louis pasteur's habit was to rise in the morning at half past five for he had to tutor certain pupils of m barbet from six o'clock until seven for he had been admitted to the pension on payment of only one-third of the usual fee then he attended courses at the lycee saint louis went to the sorbonne to hear the lectures of the famous chemist dumas who afforded him many a devout thrill when he spoke loftily of science and of the vast horizons that it opens to the human eye he returned from these inspiring lessons trembling with emotion burning with the desire to mark his own trail among those of his precursors to be one of those who have raised a corner of the veil which hides nature's secrets from us he was in such haste to learn he felt such need of incessant work that on the days of freedom thursdays and sundays he used to shut himself up in the libraries and whenever he consented to take a walk with chapuis it was only on the condition that they should discuss as they walked some question of literature or philosophy the young student's resources were very slender in spite of the fact that the sympathy he had aroused in m barbet and the services he had rendered him had caused the latter to end by remitting the whole of the usual charge yet he had sufficient to pay for his pleasures at the urgent request of his father he consented to go on certain sundays to dine at the palais royal where the sum he spent was scarcely ever more than forty sous and the crowning feature of this great treat was when louis pasteur allowed himself the luxury of the theatre a thing which by the way occurred only four times during the whole period of his studies it was in eighteen forty three that he achieved the height of his ambitions he entered the ecole normale the fourth and a good class and he was so eager to breathe the air of the famous edifice that he cut short his vacation and presented himself several days before the date of opening his type of mind which was in certain respects monastic accommodated itself to the system of the ecole normale his courage was redoubled and he not only assimilated all the courses given but already began to make certain private researches he had a natural thirst for fame he glowed with enthusiasm when he read the lives of illustrious men he was kindled with the ambition to imitate them but his preference leaned toward those who were benefactors and whose discoveries were useful to humanity his father wrote to him to economize his strength and he replied reassuring him for the profound affection that he bore his family never wavered but none the less he continued to work as hard as ever work 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 was destined to be the maxim of his whole existence while a student in the ecole normale louis pasteur continued to give lessons at the pension barbet in recognition of the generous treatment he had received at the hands of its worthy master he also continued to attend the lectures of dumas and followed him with absorbed attention and to his great joy he was allowed to enter the laboratory of his instructor Baruel, who gave him much practical advice from this time forward the general development of louis pasteur seems to have been completed his genius was revealed under a double character which was destined to assure the immortality of his works he had an unlimited audacity of ideas his intuitive conceptions soared to the outermost boundaries of human thought and on the other hand he bound himself down in his experiments to an extremely rigorous method that refused to take account of any fact that had not been strictly verified while still a student he already felt the need of proselytizing he wanted to disseminate the science which he was acquiring at the cost of so much energy 
So in addition to tutoring the pupils at the Pension Barbet, he appointed himself professor to his own family, his father and sisters. He gave them problems to solve, he expounded scientific theories for their benefit, and he infused into all his correspondence the ardor of a young apostle. If they ill understood the significance of his problems, and if the explanations which he furnished seemed too difficult to be grasped by minds that did not have the advantage of a scientific training, he would encourage them affectionately and point out the high and noble necessity of constant effort. It was a debt of gratitude that he was gladly paying to his family whose sacrifices had permitted him to obtain an education, and this touching role of the distinguished son and brother, giving instruction from a distance to his aged father and young sisters, reveals the bigness of his heart. After three years at the École Normale, Louis Pasteur passed his examinations for his degree in physical sciences in 1846. Out of four candidates, four were passed, among whom he stood third, with no special distinction. What was the young graduate going to do? Had he not now realized his most cherished wish in attaining the goal toward which he had striven with so much persistence? But during these years of study his ambition had shifted and broadened. To be sure, he still wished to be a professor and teach the sciences, but through contact with the masters of science and in the presence of the glory of their discoveries, he had become determined to distinguish himself in his turn by personal discoveries, almost as though he had a presentiment of his own high destiny. After he was graduated, it was not without anxiety that he realized that he might be sent to some provincial college, far from all the instruments essential to him. He was spared this misfortune through the interest which he had been able to inspire in his teachers, Dumas, de la fosse and ballard the last of whom took him as assistant in his laboratory what at this time was the object of louis pasteur's researches how was he going to approach the great problems of science it seems as though a sort of predestination marked out his scientific career pasteur who was destined to arrive finally at the vaccines of hydrophobia began with the study of crystals and his whole career was a sort of luminous ascension, progressing from the constitution of matter and its processes all the way to the transformation of microbes, the infinitely small yet most redoubtable enemies of man, into curative agents. Crystallography was then a new science with hesitant and controverted formulas. Essential phenomena remained without explanation, and others were still undiscovered, escaping all observation and all control. In order to judge adequately of the inspired novelty of Pasteur's discoveries, it is necessary to understand the state of this science at the moment when he began his work. In 1840, the men of science had only chaotic knowledge of the molecular structure of crystals. They knew the chemical molecule, writes Monsieur Duclos, the great authority who was one of Pasteur's disciples, they knew that it is formed of an ordinarily fairly stable group of atoms, of which the number, the weight, and the nature may usually be clearly defined. They knew, for example, that there are one atom of chlorine and one atom of sodium and sea salt, one atom of calcium, one atom of carbon, and three atoms of oxygen in carbonate of lime. They had recognized that different composite molecules are ordinarily differentiated by the number and nature of their component atoms, but that nevertheless there are some which contain the same number of the same atoms without for that reason being identical, so that they were led to suspect that they differed in the arrangement of their atoms. What could be the relative disposition of these atoms one to another within the molecule? And what would be the resultant form of the molecule itself? All these were questions on which no one had any clear idea. Aoui, 
who had made a very special study of crystals and had named their constructive molecule the integrant molecule, considered that this latter had no relation to the chemical molecule, and that their different groupings were produced by molecules identically the same. Mitzerlich demonstrated that this theory was not absolutely exact, by replacing the atoms of calcium with atoms of magnesium in a crystallization of carbonate of lime without altering its form. This constituted the phenomenon of isomorphism. De La Fosse, a pupil of Aoui and one of Pasteur's professors, was destined to study the phenomenon of hemihedrism, that by which certain crystals evade the law of symmetry and possess one facet which has no corresponding one, but he was unable to find the explanation. On the other hand, Bio had for a long time been investigating the rotary power of hemihedric crystals, and he had established that certain of them could deflect polarized light to the right and others to the left. This necessitates an explanation which we will borrow from M. Duclos. We all know, he writes, that every luminous impression is the result of a vibration accomplished after the fashion of a rigid rod, which, held in a vice at one of its extremities, vibrates at the other by oscillating around its position of equilibrium. Now, if at the movable extremity it has a polished button reflecting a point of light, we can make this point of light describe an ellipse, a circle, or a straight line. Let us examine this last case, which is the simplest, and let us agree to give the name of plane of polarization to the plane which contains the vibrating rod and the line of light described by its extremity. Let us suppose that this plane is vertical, and that the point of light is moving before us in line with the hands of a clock pointing to six o'clock. So long as there is nothing but the air intervening between the point of light and our eye, the vibration will not change its direction. But there are certain transparent substances which, when traversed by it, would turn it to the position of the hands of a clock pointing to five minutes to five. If the substance passed through were of a given thickness, and to ten minutes to four, if it were double that thickness. In other terms, they cause the plane of polarization to rotate to the left to an extent proportionate to their thickness. We will call substances having the power of rotation to the left, left substances. There also exist certain right substances, for which mutatis mutandis, the definition is the same. Young Louis Pasteur entered upon his work in the full midst of the evolution of the science of crystallography, which led from physics toward chemistry that was still full of unsolved problems. In pursuing the work required for the last of his university degrees, he tried to reconcile those personal studies that were dictated by his individual taste with those that were to give him the high title of doctor of science he initiated himself into the practical manipulation of the laboratory, he trained himself in those infinitely delicate experiments which, if they were to be profitable and fruitful, demand calmness and unremitting attention. With a profound sense of realities, he recommenced, as a test of his own accuracy, the experiments of La Provoste in tartaric acid and the tartrates seeking above all to learn whether by following the same procedure he would obtain the same results. For Louis Pasteur, this was a period of intellectual fermentation in which ideas flowed to his brain in extraordinary abundance, some of them perhaps still confused, but for the most part new and destined to open up unforeseen paths to science. On the 23rd of August, 1847, he defended his theses for the doctorate, which were piously dedicated to his father and mother, the one in chemistry treating of 
researches into the capacity of saturation of arsenious acid and forming a study of the arsenites of potash sodium and ammonia and that in physics containing a study of the phenomena relating to the rotary polarization of liquids following his defence of these theses which won him the degree of doctor he took an extremely brief rest at arbois and it was with a sort of feverish impatience that he returned to paris to continue his study of crystals it was destined to continue for five years and to end by shedding light upon what had hitherto been nothing but darkness and confusion it is impossible to mention all the details and fluctuations of this research for while great flashes of inspired intuition opened up new aspects of science he verified them by so many experiments rigorously conducted and frequently repeated that a detailed account would mean a bulletin of his daily toil in proportion as he obtained results he addressed notes to the academy of sciences the first dating from eighteen forty eight note on the crystallization of sulphur researches into the different modes of grouping in sulphate of potash researches in dimorphism memorandum on the relation which may exist between crystalline form and chemical composition and on the causes of rotary polarization End of section two. Section three of Louis Pasteur by Albert Keim and Louis Lumet, translated by Frederick Tabor Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter two A Laborious and Enthusiastic Youth, Part two. These austere labors, this life of the laboratory which kept his mind constantly occupied and concentrated on problems difficult of solution, nevertheless in no wise isolated him from the vital interests of the French nation. In common with all other young students, he had thrilled at the proclamation of the Republic in 1848, and it was with enthusiasm that he greeted the words, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity light of purse though he was our young savant gave to his country his entire savings one hundred and fifty francs and he was delighted to serve in the national guard it was a duty which he joyfully performed on behalf of his native land for under all circumstances pasteur was a man who did his duty a cruel bereavement was destined shortly afterwards to interrupt his activities during several months. His mother died suddenly in May 1848, and it is easy to conceive how keen his grief was, since we know what a profound affection he cherished for his family, which equally with science held first place in his thoughts. For long weeks he found himself incapable of accomplishing any work yet nevertheless he continued the course of his studies so keen was his passion for scientific research meanwhile his communications to the academy of science had attracted the attention of the learned world to his work its full value and originality was recognized and the highest expectations were held regarding his further researches pasteur who in a vague way was already conscious of his genius regarded them as no more than a schoolboy's clever essays, but in his study of the tartrates and paratartrates he was destined to distinguish himself in a marvellous manner. Without entering into a minute explanation of these questions, it should be understood that Mitscherlich, who had made some remarkable experiments with crystals, had proved that tartrates and paratartrates were the same identical salts, excepting that the former acted upon polarized light and possessed a rotatory power, while the latter remained without action. It is at this precise point that we are forced to admire the inspired intuition of Pasteur, who, starting from a preconceived idea, proved experimentally that it was correct why was there this difference he asked himself between salts which appeared to be identical undoubtedly 
it was due to a difference in their composition which had an influence upon their external aspect a difference which had not yet been observed and this difference he discovered by a searching examination of these crystals the tartrates had one hemihedric facet were manchot one-armed to borrow m duclos vivid simile while the paratartrates obeyed the law of symmetry in regard to their facets the rotatory power was directly related to the dissymmetry of the molecular structure this first discovery was followed by a second which was in a way a consequence of it and which revolutionized all the hitherto acquired knowledge of molecular composition pasteur resolved to find out why the paratartrates did not deflect light he analyzed them anew at great length and he perceived that the double paratartrates of sodium and ammonia like those of sodium and potassium had hemihedric crystals but that the ones were left-handed and the others right-handed this seemed to contradict his first discovery and it was at this point in his labours that his decisive experiment took place in spite of much that was unexpected in this result he said i none the less continued to follow up my idea i carefully separated out the right-hand hemihedric crystals and the left-hand hemihedric crystals and i observed separately the effect of their solutions in the polarizing apparatus i then saw with no less surprise than delight that the right-hand hemihedric crystals deflected the plane of polarization to the right and the left-hand hemihedric crystals deflected to the left and when i took an equal weight of each kind of these crystals the mixed solution was neutral in its effect on polarized light through the neutralization of the two individual deflections that were equal and in opposite directions researches in molecular dissymmetry lecture delivered before the société chimique de paris eighteen sixty nine page twenty nine in the presence of this confirmation which fulfilled his highest hopes pasteur was seized with such emotion that he was forced to leave his library on a run and flung his arms around the first of his colleagues whom he met in his keen joy over his essential discovery he broke the news to billot who for long years had been studying the rotary power of crystals by notifying him that he was ready to communicate the results of his experiments the aged scientist and member of the institute accepted his young colleague's offer and the scene which took place between them was one of real beauty it was admirably recorded by m valery radeau the meeting took place at the collège de france where billot lived every slightest detail of that interview must have remained fixed forever in pasteur's memory billot began by going in search of a paratartaric acid i have studied it he said with particular care it is perfectly neutral in relation to polarized light a tinge of mistrust was visible in his gestures and betrayed itself in the tone of his voice i will bring you everything you need continued the old man as he went in quest of the required quantities of soda and ammonia he desired that the double salt should be prepared in his presence after pouring the liquid obtained into the crystallizer billot took it and set it aside in one corner of his apartment in order to be quite sure that no one would touch it i will notify you when you are to come back he said to pasteur as he ushered him out forty-eight hours later the crystals very small at first began to take form when there appeared to be sufficient quantity of them pasteur was summoned still in the presence of billot pasteur drew out the finest crystals one by one and wiped them in order to remove the mother liquid adhering to them then pointed out to billot the opposition of their hemihedric character and separated them into two groups right crystals and left crystals you claim said billot that the crystals placed on your right will deflect the plane of polarization to the right 
and that the crystals placed on your left will deflect it to the left. Yes, replied Pasteur. Very well, I will attend to the rest. Biot prepared the solutions and once again sent for Pasteur. Biot began by placing in the apparatus the solution which was supposed to deflect to the left. When the deflection was verified, he took Pasteur by the arm and uttered the phrase which has so often been cited and which deserves to become famous. My dear boy, I have loved science so dearly all my life that this sets my heart beating. As a matter of fact, Pasteur afterwards said in recalling this interview, it was evident that the most vivid light had been thrown upon the cause of the phenomenon of rotary polarization and on the hemihedrism of crystals, that a new class of isomeric substances had been discovered, that the unexpected and hitherto unexampled formation of racemic or paratartaric acid had been unveiled, in a word, that a great path, new and unforeseen, had been opened to science, la vie de Pasteur. The encouragements of his masters, Ballard and Biot, their praises and the certainty that he would not be obliged to interrupt the sequence of his discoveries kept him in a state of feverish activity. But at the end of 1848 he was obliged to leave the laboratory in spite of the intervention of his protectors and betake himself to the lycée at Dijon, to which he had been appointed professor of physics. It was not without regret that he abandoned his experimental courses and his researches, for he felt that his personal labors were of more use to science than any instruction that he might give. Nevertheless, he submitted to the order of the Minister of Instruction, and from the moment that he was installed, applied himself to a conscientious fulfillment of the duties of his new function. He proved himself to be a methodical and painstaking professor, seeking above all things to be clear in expounding the science that he taught, and far from priding himself on the superiority of his own intelligence, he spent long hours in preparing his lectures in order to make them easily comprehensible to his young students. Nevertheless, in spite of his faithful performance of his duties as a public instructor, he was not without regret for the days that he must spend outside of the laboratory. This inactivity in regard to his personal researches weighed so heavily upon him that he asked to be transferred some months after his arrival at Dijon, and upon being appointed to the faculty of Strasbourg as substitute professor of chemistry, was able to take possession of his new office on the 15th of January, 1849, and to continue his researches in spite of the scanty equipment that he had at his disposal. An event of great importance in the life of Pasteur awaited him at Strasbourg, and one which was destined to have a most fortunate influence upon his whole career as a scientist, for it was here that he was soon to find domestic happiness. From his very first visit to the president of the faculty, M. Laurent, he conceived a strong partiality for one of the daughters, Mademoiselle Marie Laurent. With that provision which was characteristic of him, he was straightway convinced that this young lady was the one essential to his hearth and home, and having once made up his mind, he acted with his customary prompt decision and asked her hand in marriage. Between his arrival in Strasbourg and his request, less than fifteen days had intervened. M. Laurent, to whom he presented a short note setting forth with admirable sincerity his financial status, his position in the university, and his ambitions, accepted him as son-in-law. This was a day to be marked with a white stone, for Madame Pasteur, down to the last day of her husband's life, never ceased to surround him with the tenderest and most devoted care, to watch over his hours of toil and his hours of rest, and to keep him in such a state that he could employ his genius to the full extent of its powers. Louis Pasteur remained on the faculty of Strasbourg until 1854, and was appointed titular professor of chemistry in 1852. 
this whole period is marked by numerous researches which form the natural sequence of those that he undertook in crystallography but which extend far beyond that science thanks to the new perceptions that he brought to them and the consequences which naturally developed from them from this same aspect of dissymmetry and hemihedrism he studied the aspartates and the malates shed light upon obscure questions which no chemist before had successfully handled established the laws of molecular dissymmetry and took up and solved the problem of dissymmetry in cellular life pasteur continued to address memoranda to the academy of sciences and the learned world began to be stirred by these communications which proved him to be an investigator endowed with genius the most celebrated members of the institute followed his progress with sympathetic interest men such as dumas whom as a young student he could not hear lecture at the sorbonne without emotion billot ballard regnault and Senarmont and it occurred to them to elect him as corresponding member of the Academy of Sciences. During a visit of the illustrious scientist Metterlich to Paris, Louis Pasteur had the pleasure of showing the results he had obtained to the German crystallographer, who thanked and congratulated him and informed him that the extremely rare racemic acid was still manufactured in Germany. At this news, pasteur's zeal caught fire and since it was vacation time he set forth in september eighteen fifty two on the pursuit of this singular substance which had once been obtained by accident at dun which had since been lost sight of and which he was now informed was to be found at a manufactory of chemical products in saxony there followed a mad chase throughout the length and breadth of germany louis pasteur kept a journal of his varied adventures which he sent to his wife and which reveals his passionate ardour his immense desire to possess at last this acid which had once astonished the scientific world the chase was a heroic one pasteur went from leipzig to zwickau from zwickau to dresden from dresden to freiberg from freiberg to vienna from vienna to prague filled alternately with emotions of hope and despair according as he thought that he had found racemic acid or that the elusive substance still seemed to evade him i will pursue it for ten years if need be he wrote to madame pasteur his researches his experiments in the manufactories his inquiries did not hinder him from visiting the museums and here it was that the artistic side of his nature found satisfaction in dresden he kept a record of the paintings which pleased him and he made notes which show the degree of his admiration for each of them pasteur debated the question of going all the way to venice in order to obtain crude tartar which contained the rare acid but he returned to france without having made this extra journey and very much fatigued by his long ramblings he had convinced himself that racemic acid existed in tartar that had not been washed and that it was to be found in the mother liquid hence his pursuit had not been unprofitable upon returning to his laboratory in strasbourg pasteur undertook a task which it seemed to him would be difficult to realize but which was not beyond his powers he had decided that this racemic acid which no other chemist had produced should issue from his own laboratory with this ambitious design he began experiments of unimagined delicacy working with confidence although the master chemists whom he had told of his intention believed that he could not succeed he was destined to triumph the magician was about to vanquish nature in june of eighteen fifty three he announced to his father and to bio that he had artificially obtained racemic acid it was a splendid victory which amazed all scientists versed in the study of crystals and of chemistry the academy of sciences gave prolonged attention to this discovery and the society of chemistry bestowed upon its author a prize of fifteen hundred francs 
which it had offered to any one who could produce this extraordinary acid. With his usual disinterestedness, Pasteur spent half of this sum in the purchase of such instruments as were lacking in the Strasbourg laboratory. The government took notice of the achievements of the young scientist that were so magnificently crowned by a success which his own masters had not expected, and Louis Pasteur received the cross of the Legion of Honor when he was barely thirty years of age. End of section three. Section four of Louis Pasteur by Albert Keim and Louis Lumet, translated by Frederick Tabor Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter three on the road to fame part one it needs only a brief examination in order to realize that the works of pasteur even those most widely different in appearance follow one another like the links of a chain and present an admirable unity toward the end of his studies of crystals his ideas became generalized and extended his theory of molecular dissymmetry to the constitution of the universe while a certain laboratory experiment was destined to turn his attention to ferments having broken a crystal of tartrate pasteur plunged it again into the mother liquid and discovering that the crystal became restored in its entirety he compared this breakage to a wound which is healed with the help of new molecules of its own kind on the other hand, he had observed that the tartrates undergo veritable fermentations, and he believed that these fermentations might be due to a microscopic organism which played the role of a ferment. So that, setting forth from crystallography, he finally arrived at researches into the origin of life. Having been appointed professor of chemistry and dean of the faculty recently founded at Lille in 1854, Pasteur, while faithfully fulfilling his pedagogical duties, prepared to carry on his studies of fermentations. He spared no pains to prove himself worthy of the confidence placed in him by Monsieur Fortoul, the minister of public instruction, and he succeeded in raising the new faculty entrusted to him to the first rank of scientific establishments. More than 200 auditors attended his courses, and 21 students were enrolled for practical work in the laboratory. He exerted himself to carry out the program of the minister, whose desire was to train operators and practical workers in the higher manufacturing industries, but he never ceased to repeat that nothing counted apart from theory, and that theory alone could be productive of great results. At the same time, Pasteur initiated his students into industrial methods by taking them to visit the manufacturers of the neighborhood, where they were able to judge at first hand which were the best of the methods employed. Furthermore, the General Council of the North recognized the practical value of his knowledge and his teaching by entrusting him with the examination of the fertilizers essential to agriculture. The problem of fermentations which Pasteur was preparing to solve victoriously was even more obscure than those offered by crystallography. How did the heavy dough, formed of flour mixed with water, become the light and substantial bread? How was the crushed grape transformed into wine? Undoubtedly these questions had occupied the attention of man ever since the most remote antiquity, and many answers were made to them, but no answer that was scientifically satisfactory. The alchemists of the Middle Ages thought that yeast had a certain power of transmutation, and that fermentation, if applied to metals, would enable them to transmute a base metal such as iron into a precious metal such as gold. The first of all to approach the truth was Paracelsus, who compared fermentations to diseases. But his idea was still vague and not based upon experiments. 
we must wait until we come down to Lavoisier in order to see fermentations studied upon a basis of facts. But neither this great chemist nor those who followed him, Gay Lussac, Cagnard Latour, Schwann, Hemholtz, Liebig, succeeded in demonstrating their real origin. The theory most generally accepted at the time when Pasteur began his researches was that of Liebig, who attributed fermentations to matter in the course of decomposition, which played the role of a ferment in the mediums into which they were introduced. It was in a sugar refinery at Lille, owned by Monsieur Bigot, that Pasteur entered upon the study of fermentations. He approached it equipped with all the knowledge acquired through his work in the tartrates, which must have singularly aided him to reach a solution of the problem that had been so long and vainly sought. We cannot follow him through these delicate and difficult experiments, but he arrived at this luminous and unforeseen conclusion that fermentation was not a phenomenon of death, as Liebig had thought it, but a phenomenon of life, and this he proved in an irrefutable manner. His experiments, which were directed more especially to lactic and alcoholic fermentation, showed him that all fermentation was due to the presence of living cells, which alone were the active agents of the transformation. These cells had a life of their own, and the phenomena of fermentations were closely connected with it and influenced by the different phases of its evolution, according as these cells were ill, dying, or in full vigor. This was indeed a light thrown upon what had hitherto been nothing but darkness, a discovery which was destined to create an entire new science and of which the consequences were at that time incalculable. The scientific associations, both in France and abroad, disturbed at first by Pasteur's far-sighted genius and by the unforeseen results of his researches, awaited his communications with something bordering upon impatience. He received recognition beyond any of the other young investigators, for he had proved himself to be one of those with whom it was henceforth necessary to reckon. He began to receive recompenses. In 1857, the Royal Society of London bestowed upon him the great Rumford Medal for his work in crystallography, and the same year his friends in the Institute and Bio among the first who felt a paternal affection for him, urged him to present himself as a candidate for the Academy of Sciences in the section of mineralogy. Pasteur accepted this flattering invitation from the masters of his profession, who now looked upon him as at least their equal, but he made a rather sorry candidate, being too fond of truth and justice to be willing to play upon those little human vanities which assure success in all elections. Accordingly, in spite of Sinarmont's report, which was highly eulogistic of Pasteur's discoveries, insisting upon their value and importance, Pasteur received only sixteen votes. He took his way back to Lille, not greatly cast down by a defeat which he had foreseen, but he remained there only a short time, because on the opening of the scholastic year of 1857 he was appointed administrator of the École Normale and director of the scientific studies, while Nissard assumed the general direction. Henceforth this was to be the centre of Pasteur's life, his whole life of toil, of combats on behalf of science and humanity, and his family life as well, a very happy one, notwithstanding that it was destined to be marked by some inevitable bereavements which his profound faith as a Catholic aided him to bear. It was from the little laboratory in the Rue d'Ulme that the great and peaceful revolution was to proceed designed to cure all the ills of life by penetrating the secrets of nature. It ought to be regarded as a sacred spot 
for one of the finest of all human minds lived and thought there while such high virtues as courage perseverance and moral strength were there put into magnificent practice monsieur maurice de fleury has related how pasteur never ceased working even when his laborious day was ended during fifteen years he says he could be seen each evening after dinner pacing up and down a long corridor where no one dared to come and interrupt his reverie paralyzed since eighteen seventy for on two different occasions apoplexy attacked his brain he would seize the bunch of keys in his pocket with his stiffened hand and make them rattle in order to soothe his thoughts with the rhythmic sound and as he walked he slightly dragged one foot while his mind ripened some newly conceived idea or prepared for the experiment of the morrow at times his reverie assumed the intensity of ecstasy and within the brain of this man of genius flashes of light revealed his goal and gave him a prevision of all that was destined to emanate from him how beautiful it is how beautiful it is he would murmur in low tones then resuming his pacing with a firmer step he would add i must work and so he would continue until the hour of eleven is there not something deeply touching in this picture of the great man toiling on into the night after all the experiments he had made during the day experiments made under very hard conditions his laboratory in the ecole normale was as a matter of fact exceedingly primitive and inconvenient it consisted of two inadequate rooms which he himself had contrived in the garret and while it was freezing cold in winter during the summer the temperature would rise to ninety seven degrees fahrenheit nevertheless it was here that he completed his studies of fermentation from eighteen fifty seven to eighteen fifty nine and notably those of alcoholic fermentation it was here also that he was destined to discover a phenomenon which overthrew all accepted ideas regarding the essential conditions of animal life no one had questioned that oxygen was a necessity to all animals without exception pasteur proceeded to prove that for certain species it was fatal and that they died at its contact while examining under the microscope a tiny drop of butyric fermentation placed between two very thin sheets of glass pasteur observed that the bacteria known as the vibrion which produced this fermentation were very lively at the centre and furthest from the air but that those near the border line became inert what was he to conclude from this phenomenon which contradicted all observations that he had previously made of various infusions in which the animalcula left the centre of the drop in order to draw near to the margin which supplied them with more oxygen was it possible that there were animal forms which made an exception to a law that was supposed to be general were there some that led an anaerobic life that is without oxygen while it had previously been regarded as settled that all animals led an aerobic life in which oxygen was necessary pasteur solved this question by passing a current of air into a flask containing a butyric fermentation and immediately the life of the vibrions diminished in intensity and finally ceased the proof had been obtained that there were animal forms to which oxygen was fatal but how did it happen that these anaerobic vibrions had not met with oxygen in the medium in which they were bred it was because the aerobic vibrions which preceded their evolution had exhausted all the oxygen in the liquid and thus gave them a chance to live and multiply furthermore these two forms of life were found coexisting in the same liquid a part of the aerobic forms having died and fallen to the bottom of the vessel after exhausting the oxygen while the more vigorous rose to the surface and continued to live 
thanks to the oxygen in the air, and formed at the same time a protective layer for the anaerobics, which were thus enabled to develop in the lower depths. Pasteur was destined later on to study in detail these phenomena which no one before him had observed, and to gather new light from them. M. Duclos emphasizes the element of genius in these researches. I have tried to present all these deductions as a whole, he writes, because, as a matter of fact, they were the result of a few weeks of work and meditation, and also because they afford us an example of Pasteur's power of penetration in perceiving and outlining a problem, and the patience he exhibited in gathering together the elements essential to a solution. Throughout the best years of his life this man lived in advance of his time, a pioneer lost in solitude, absorbed in the contemplation of the horizons he had discovered, and which his eye alone could behold and traverse. What is less surprising than his indifference to the details of actual life? He lived in his own thoughts without being a dreamer, for a dream which reaches its goal and produces results ceases to be a dream. End of section four. Section 5 of Louis Pasteur by Albert Keim and Louis Lumet. Translated by Frederick Tabor Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 3 On the Road to Fame, Part 2. But these delicate experiments and lofty speculations did not make Pasteur forget that he was administrator of the Ecole Normale as well as director of scientific studies. And never did a man take his duties more seriously than he, even when they were a burden and a constraint. He applied himself to everything that he undertook with the same degree of attention and conscientiousness, and nothing seemed to him too trivial to be worthy of supervision and painstaking. Accordingly, he took every pains to give a perfect administration to the great school that he still loved as well as he had done in boyhood when it had appeared to him as the far-off goal of his highest hopes. He concerned himself about the health of the students and the hygiene of the locality, and even the smallest details were objects of his solicitude, such as airing a classroom or sanding a court. Even the scientific side of his mind found employment in the administrative role. For instance, when he undertook comparative calculations as to the number of ounces of meat furnished for each meal to the students at the Normal and the Polytechnique. This anxiety to be a good administrator in no wise interfered with his researches. He accepted the additional burden without complaint, and his scientific activity was in no wise retarded in the same manner that crystals led him to fermentations. It was these latter which were destined to lead him to studies which seemed to overstep the boundary of science and to enter the metaphysical domain of the origins of life, the solution of which had hitherto been the concern of philosophers rather than scientists. When Pasteur saw, under the lens of a microscope, cells of a yeast conducting themselves like living organisms, when he saw the vibrions moving, growing, and dying, he straightway asked himself, where these yeasts and these vibrions come from? Are they born spontaneously from matter in a state of decomposition, or is it not more likely that in accordance with the general laws of life they are produced by germs? This was, in short, the question of spontaneous generation, which had so long been combated and which he now undertook to solve. Pasteur believed that nothing is self-creative, but this was something which had to be proved, and he succeeded in proving it victoriously in the full heat of battle and in spite of the attacks and insults of those who championed the opposite doctrine. His friends, with Billot at their head, tried to turn him aside from these researches which they judged useless and vain. But Pasteur 
strong in his conviction and with that dogged will which never turned back from any obstacle as long as he was sure that he had grasped the truth disregarded the advice of his elders and plunged into experiments that bristled with difficulties from the most remote antiquity spontaneous generation had been accepted and it is well known that the ancients believed that eels were born from the slime of river banks and that it did not seem to them impossible that bees should issue from the decomposing entrails of a bull without going quite so far back we find that the great naturalist buffon supported the theory of spontaneous generation but the first experiments to prove its truth were made by an irishman needham in the eighteenth century in closing putrefying matter in a vessel which he sealed hermetically and heating the whole apparatus in hot ashes in order to destroy all living germs he allowed the vessel to become cold and after the lapse of several days he found that it contained animalcula this went to prove that spontaneous generation had taken place spallanzani repeated these experiments and after heating the closed vessel to a higher degree observed that no animalcula afterwards developed needham rejoined that by using too high a degree of heat he had killed the vegetative force from which creation proceeded none of these experiments was conclusive and although they were repeated by gay lussac schulze and schwann their results remained uncertain and often contradictory when pasteur intervened the theory of spontaneous generation was supported by pouchet and it may be said that it was accepted by a considerable number of scientists it is true however that no decisive evidence had been offered either for or against the theory it was at this moment that pasteur revealed himself not only as a man of daring and profound thought but as the most careful and experienced of operators to those who believed in spontaneous generation he said everything comes from a germ and even these animalcula which seem to you to have been born spontaneously in the infusions in which they develop come quite simply from germs and spores which are floating in the air you have conducted your experiments badly i will begin them over again and i will prove to you that the substances which you regard as subject to decay are not so when they are rigorously sheltered from the air pasteur began his experiments at the end of eighteen fifty nine and he pursued them in the midst of the din of battle for his adversaries disputed his conclusions in advance the contest lasted for more than four years with attacks counter-attacks and violent battles but finally the victory remained with pasteur without even his most bitter enemies venturing to dispute him further assailing his problem at its foundations he proved the actual existence of germs and spores in the atmosphere then he conceived of a distribution of glass globes which would enable him to demonstrate by experiment what he had already maintained against the supporters of spontaneous generation pasteur declared that germs are unevenly distributed in the atmosphere and that the air of high mountain tops contains either few or none at all pouchet and joly on the contrary contended that air by its own nature could cause spontaneous generation in any and every locality both parties made experiments in their own behalf and each experiment gave different results these polemics spread beyond scientific circles to the daily press and since the question of religion was involved the public took sides for the one party or the other according to their individual opinions the results obtained by pasteur being regarded as conforming with the biblical account of the creation while those of pouchet seemed to invalidate and contradict it for his first demonstration pasteur employed globes with a curving neck into which he introduced an infusion liable to putrefy either of hay or of malt which had been brought to the boiling point in order to destroy whatever germs it might contain and having done this he left the globes exposed to the open air no disturbances took place in the infusion but if by tipping the globes 
he brought the liquid into contact with the walls of the curved neck after a longer or shorter time the infusion would begin to swarm with life thus furnishing a double proof first that pure air has no effect upon liquids subject to putrefaction and secondly that it was the germs and spores heavier than the air which had been deposited in the curved neck that gave birth to the infusoria popularly attributed to spontaneous generation on the other side pouchet declared that the air being everywhere the same had the power no matter where it was gathered of causing the creation of vibrions through its action upon liquids subject to putrefaction while pasteur continued to maintain that germs and spores were unequally distributed in the atmosphere and that if the air were taken from the mountain tops it was impossible that it should disturb the liquids brought into contact with it since there would be a complete absence of germs and spores the experiments which pasteur made as simple as they are conclusive to demonstrate the truth of his conception have remained historic it was through the aid of globes with a straight neck finely drawn out that he ultimately succeeded and this is the way that he achieved his proof thanks to his practical qualities as an experimenter of extreme caution who never left anything to chance after having half filled his globes with some alterable liquid such as an infusion of brewer's yeast pasteur brought it to the boiling point and when the steam had driven out all the air he quickly closed the point of the finely drawn out neck by means of a blowpipe the globes thus prepared the liquid being contained in an almost absolute vacuum were transported to various different localities and then opened with infinite precautions the fine point of the neck was broken with pincers previously heated in a flame the air re-entering the globes which were immediately sealed again and placed in ovens where they were subjected to a temperature of eighty six degrees fahrenheit the liquid behaved differently according to the locality from which the air had been obtained the fermentation being very rapid if it had come from a neighbourhood where there was much dust much slower when it was taken for instance from the cellar of the observatory and in some cases there was no alteration at all in spite of these results pasteur's experiments continued to be disputed he resolved to undertake a scientific campaign against which his adversaries should no longer be able to stand out armed with sixty-three globes he set forth in september eighteen sixty for the mountain heights of the alps he halted first at arbois where he took some specimens of air then from mount puget he proceeded to chamonix and there he opened some of his globes on the mer de glace there in that pure air far from human crowds germs and spores ought either not to exist or else to be very rare the results proved that he was right out of twenty globes opened in the mountain heights nineteen proved sterile while in the case of those into which air was admitted at lower levels the proportion of sterile ones out of the same number fell off to fifteen and to twelve the proof was decisive but pouchet his bitterest opponent having repeated the same experiments only with a less degree of care arrived at different results and denied the value of pasteur's demonstrations he also had obtained air from various localities even from sicily and there just as elsewhere he had found it fertile and ready to act upon liquids capable of putrefying the conflict assumed epic proportions the sessions of the academy of sciences caught the echoes of it each theory having its partisans and each experimenter his enemies pasteur however ended by convincing the learned assemblage which in eighteen sixty two awarded him a prize for his memorandum on organic corpuscles existing in the atmosphere alone or almost alone pouchet joly and musee refused to lay down arms and continued to carry on an active war in order to force them to surrender pasteur requested the academy of sciences to name a commission to judge between him and his adversaries 
each party having required to repeat his experiments in the presence of the commissioners chosen Pouchet, joly and musee accepted but on the day appointed for the tests they announced that they had failed while pasteur accompanied by duclos arrived bringing his globes and his liquids with him the experiment was a success and ballon recorded in the name of the commission the conclusive results in the compte rendu de l'académie des sciences after a hard campaign of several years pasteur was at last triumphant this question of spontaneous generation aroused an interest outside of the men of science it had called attention to the mysterious world of infinitely little things and people were eager to gather around the microscope in order to see these redoubtable organisms the full extent of whose power was as yet unknown pasteur had obtained the concession of a suite of five rooms in the ecole normale to be used as a laboratory having thus been enabled to quit his garret he began to receive illustrious visitors statesmen society women personages of high standing at court all of whom came to beg him to initiate them into the secrets which he had discovered and of which he seemed to be the sole guardian during his researches in spontaneous generation pasteur had received from the academy of sciences in eighteen sixty the prize for experimental physiology and in eighteen sixty one he had for a second time presented himself as a candidate in the section of botany he was supported by his faithful friend billot but nevertheless he obtained only twenty-four votes he was not destined to be elected until the eighth of december eighteen sixty two with a majority of thirty-six out of a total of sixty votes to the section of mineralogy where he succeeded Sinarmont pasteur was now celebrated acclaimed by some and combated by others who were unable to comprehend the utterly new order of his genius napoleon the third expressed his desire to meet him and it was his first master dumas the one who had formerly caused pasteur such keen emotion by his lectures on chemistry at the sorbonne who presented him to the emperor at the tuileries in march eighteen sixty three pasteur delighted napoleon the third by his serious and simple manner he explained his ideas regarding the scientific problems on which he was engaged and confessed to the emperor that his most secret ambition was to study contagious diseases in order to find a cure for all humanity End of section five Section six of Louis Pasteur by Albert Keim and Louis Lumet, translated by Frederick Tabor Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. For the National Wealth, Part One. The campaign which Pasteur was conducting against spontaneous generation did not absorb his entire activity. He pursued his studies of fermentation striving to penetrate the secrets of the infinitely small the yeasts the vibrions the infusoria that whole disquieting world the universal and formidable activity of which was not even yet suspected perhaps he already discerned although only vaguely their presence in human diseases and this was the object of his researches and profound meditations pasteur used to arrive at his laboratory walking slowly sunk in thought and with his forehead lined with care he gave orders to his assistants pointing out the experiments which he wished to have made but never revealing the idea behind them succeeding roland he had duclos who was still young and who was destined to become a great scientist duclos admired the achievements of his master and with his keen and lucid mind followed his luminous trail while he often added to his duties as assistant the humbler ones of a laboratory attendant wiping the apparatus the retorts and flasks a devoted servant in the temple of science a rather sorry temple by the way for the laboratory was extremely inconvenient with its five scanty rooms and a stove installed behind the staircase 
where Pasteur could not even enter except on his knees. Duclos compared it to a rabbit cage, and yet it was from here, he said, that the movement started which revolutionized science. Already at that epoch a large faction of the younger generation of scientists had come under the daily increasing influence of Pasteur. The normal school chemists of 1860, wrote Mrs. Duclos in her Vie d'Emile Duclos, believed in Pasteur as the Romantics of 1830 believed in Victor Hugo. They saw before them virgin lands and unimagined sources. Thanks to the genius, the faith, and the religious spirit that the master infused into his work, he inspired these younger men with his own enthusiasm, and they believed themselves born to revolutionize the ideas which had served as dogmas for their predecessors, and such a belief is strangely intoxicating to young brains. Among the assistants and students who gathered around Monsieur Pasteur, in the little laboratory in the Rue d'Homme, there was a continual interchange of conceptions and of projects, very different ones from those that are born and die daily apropos of literature or philosophy. For these discussions dealt with the only form of truth that is capable of being verified, namely science. But while Pasteur kept secret the object he had in view during the course of his experiments, that were often long, difficult, and countless times recommenced, when he had once obtained his results, he boldly and vigorously proclaimed them. He had a scorn of bad faith, routine, and prejudice, and every one knows the famous apostrophe which he addressed to his adversaries who were disputing his discoveries in relation to the crystals of tartrates at a meeting of the Societe Philomatique on the 8th of December, 1862. If you have ever known anything of the subject, what have you done with your knowledge? And if you have not known, why do you interfere? He was a rough antagonist, but he fought only for the triumph of truth, putting all personal considerations aside. In the course of his studies of fermentations, Pasteur was led to study the phenomenon through which wine was transformed into vinegar. The celebrated chemist Liebig had established a theory which did not altogether agree with his own observations, and he proceeded victoriously to advance his own theory in opposition. The manufacturers of vinegar at Orléans pursued the following method. In two groups of stationary barrels, they poured a mixture of two-thirds ripened vinegar and one-third wine. On the surface of this mixture there was formed a thin film, of which no one knew the composition, but which was necessary in order to obtain a prompt and thorough acetification or transformation into vinegar. The manufacturers took great care of this film, for if it was dislodged, or if it sank to the bottom of the barrels, the whole operation had to be done over. What was this film, which, in order to work well, required a current of fresh air that was furnished by drilling an opening in the barrels a little above the level of the liquid? Pasteur worked for nearly a year on this problem, and he proved that acetification was caused by a microbe which lived on the surface of the liquid, obtained oxygen from the air, and transferred a part of it to the liquid below, which in this way was oxidized. He gave this microbe the name of Mycoderma aceti, or Mycoderma vinegar. This ferment is endowed with an extraordinary power of prolificness, the individual cells, twice as long as they are wide, are so minute that it requires four hundred of them placed end to end and eight hundred placed side by side to measure a millimeter in length. That thirty million can find space in a square centimeter and three hundred billion are formed in twenty-four hours upon a square meter of liquid. What is the weight of these three hundred billions of cells? One gram, and this gram is capable of transforming, 
ten kilograms of alcohol into vinegar in the space of five days it follows that a single cell consumes in the course of one day a quantity of nourishment equal to two thousand times its own weight from these fabulous figures one can form some conception of the activity of these infinitely small organisms and of their formidable power in the economy of universal life pasteur discovered that the mycoderm of wine could become ill and that it produced either good or bad vinegar as the case might be through proper cultivation he obtained perfect cells which when placed in a mixture of wine and vinegar produced an excellent and regular acetification up to this time the industry of the vinegar makers of orleans was subject to all sorts of losses due to ignorance and to chance pasteur furnished them with a method which never failed he saved them from the daily anxiety of obtaining bad products and he helped them to gain millions at the same time that he was occupied with vinegars pasteur had been investigating even as far back as eighteen sixty three the origin of different maladies which affect wines the municipal council of arbois priding themselves on this illustrious compatriot offered him a laboratory where he might pursue these studies that were of interest to all the wine growers of france pasteur preferred to be installed in independent quarters and duclos who on several occasions directed the experiments made at arbois has given a most picturesque description of the place the laboratory had been established in a former cafe the traditional signboard had been left above the entrance in consequence of which it often happened to us to have customers enter and ask for food and drinks generally they halted at the door surprised at the strangeness of the furnishings and took themselves off without a word assuredly carrying with them visions of the almanac of nostradamus it must be said in their defence that if the room no longer resembled a cafe it resembled a laboratory quite as little there was no gas the heating was done with coal the flames of which were made more active at the required moment with the help of fans there was no water we ourselves went like rebecca to draw it at the public fountain or like nosica to wash our utensils by the river bank our tables were trestles and as for our apparatus since nearly all of it came from the local carpenter tinsmith or blacksmith of arbois it may be imagined that they did not have the canonical forms and that when we walked through the streets on our way to the wine cellars to get the wine for the purpose of analysis we did not pass by without calling forth some sarcastic comments from the somewhat hostile inhabitants of the little town whatever this haphazard workshop may have been pasteur's experiments methodically and perseveringly continued were decisive what was the cause of the maladies of wines contrary to the widely accepted opinions pasteur proved that oxygen was not injurious to wine but that on the contrary it was oxygen which aged it and gave it flavor and bouquet wine hermetically sealed without contact with oxygen remained forever young this prejudice having been overcome by experiments pasteur showed further that each malady of wine had its own special microbe and that under the microscope it was possible to distinguish those of la tourne of la mer et la graisse all of them well-known maladies of wine but by no means the only ones how was it possible to combat these microbes the terrors of wine growers and epicures for no barrel and no bottle was surely safe pasteur tried at first to use antiseptics tasteless and odorless but without obtaining good results it was through the application of heat that he finally solved the problem and it was well worth the solving since the vineyards of france produce as a matter of fact fifty million hectolitres of an average value of five hundred million francs and suffer enormous losses through the occurrence of diseases 
pasteur heated the wines in a closed vessel to one hundred and thirty degrees fahrenheit and by thus destroying the microbes put them in a condition to be kept without danger of spoiling but this process of heating had to contend with many prejudices it was believed that it altered the quality of the wines and the growers were reluctant to adopt this method of preservation a commission was appointed to try the effect of the pasture method upon wines to be transported by sea they put on board the jean bart at brest samples of wine that had been heated and other samples that had not been heated after ten months of ocean travel the former samples were declared by the commission to be excellent in all respects while the latter samples had turned sour the experiment was repeated on board the frigate la sibylle and gave the same results the wine that had been heated preserved all its characteristic qualities and escaped all injury for that matter the protection of liquids by heating has now become general and we pasteurize milk beer etc napoleon the third became interested in pasteur's study of wines for it involved the question of safeguarding one of the principal sources of the wealth of france accordingly during one of the sojourns of the court at compiegne both he and the empress eugenie were initiated into the details of the experiments it was in eighteen sixty five that pasteur armed with his microscope and his samples of wine delivered a lecture on the subject before the emperor and empress and taught them to distinguish with their eye at the lens the microbes of the tourne from those of the amer napoleon the third expressed surprise that it had not occurred to pasteur to make a pecuniary profit out of his discoveries which were worth tens of millions to the wine industry and pasteur made this fine response in france a scientist would think that he had demeaned himself if he did such a thing according to his standards they must content themselves with glory and with the satisfaction of a duty fulfilled in pasteur napoleon the third liked both the man and the scientist and many a time he invited him either to the tuileries or to compiegne arrangements were made to conduct some experiments in the apartments of the empress and in the presence of the ladies of honour pasteur expounded the mysteries of the world of infinitely little things incidentally he met with a singular adventure which might have banished him from the court if the affection which the empress bore him had been less genuine for the purposes of a certain demonstration pasteur had needed some live frogs which he obtained from the head gardener of the parks at compiegne when the experiment was ended the absent-minded scientist left the frogs behind him imprisoned in an insecure bag they invaded the bedchamber of the empress and the latter arising during the night set her foot upon a cold and slimy frog she experienced a terrible fright and very nearly fainted afterwards she laughed at her own fear but although she bore no grudge against pasteur she could never again bear even the sight of the poor offensive frog in eighteen sixty seven pasteur received from the jury of the exposition universelle a grand prize for his services in behalf of wines but even before these researches were fully completed he had prepared to undertake a new series of studies that were destined to enhance his fame still further for fifteen years a veritable scourge had ravaged the departments of southern france the industry of rearing silkworms formerly so prosperous that the mulberry tree had come to be called the tree of gold had fallen off alarmingly with an annual loss of more than fifty million francs the people were reduced to dire poverty and the sorely tried land owners helpless to combat the cause of their ruin appealed to the government strange maladies were spreading among the silkworms which died in countless numbers and there was no remedy that seemed to help them dumas commissioned to present to the senate the petition from the affected district having confidence in the genius of pasteur begged him to consent to go and study on the spot this disease of the silkworms which was proving so fatal to a national industry 
that in the single district of Alais it had caused within five years a loss of nearly a hundred and fifty million francs. Pasteur knew nothing of the subject, but in the face of such a permanent menace, which condemned a whole section of France to the blackest misery, he consented to absent himself from his beloved laboratory in the Rue d'Olme, and to accept the commission from the Ministry of Agriculture. It was in the midst of sorrow and mourning that he was destined to carry on this new study, a long and difficult one, lasting from 1865 to 1870. For within a few years he lost his father and two of his daughters. His father, we know the profound affection that he felt for the old soldier of the empire, to whom he owed his love for work and that steadfast conscience that guided him so straightly through the path of life, his daughters, the joy and hope of his home circle. These intimate tragedies traced a few additional lines upon his austere face, but it was with the same valiant heart, the same unbiased mind, the same tenacious will, that he continued to pursue his great task on behalf of humanity. End of section 6